Hi everyone, it's Leticia again, back for chapter three of Seven Young Australians by Ethel Turner. I hope you've enjoyed the first two chapters and hope you enjoy this one as well, obviously. I've got 12 words for you today. So if you're doing spelling words or vocabulary words, make sure to grab something to write with and we'll come across those 12 words during this chapter. Chapter three is entitled, Virtue Not Always Rewarded. It was not to be expected that such an occurrence could be passed entirely over, but then again, it is difficult to punish seven children at the same time. At first, Captain Wolcott had requested Esther to ask Miss March the governess to give them all 10 French verbs to learn. But as Judy pointed out, the general and baby and Bunty and Nell had not arrived at the dignity of French verbs yet, so such a punishment would be inequitous. And that's your first word already, number one, inequitous. It's spelled I-N-I-Q-U-I-T-O-U-S. Now, before you look it up, based on how it was used in that first sentence or first paragraph, I should say, do you have any ideas of what it might mean? It said it was inequitous to give French verbs, seeing as four of the children hadn't learned French verbs yet. Then you might want to look it up and see if you were right. The sentence, therefore, had not been quite decided upon as yet, and everyone felt in an uncomfortable state of suspense. Your father says you're a disgraceful tribe, said the young stepmother slowly, sitting down on the nursery rocking chair a day later. She had on a trailing morning wrapper of white muslin with cherry ribbons, but there was a pin doing duty for a button in one or two places, and the lace was hanging off a bit at the sleeve. Meg, dear, you're very untidy, you know, and Judy's absolutely hopeless. Meg was attired in an unbecoming green cashmere with the elbows out and the plush torn off in several places, while Judy's exceedingly scant and faded pink zephyr had rents in several places, and the color was hardly be to be seen for fruit stains. And there... <laughs> is your second word for the day, Zephyr, Z-E-P-H-Y-R, Zephyr. And that was in regard to Judy's pink dress. Mention the word Zephyr. Meg colored a little. I know Esther, and I'd like to be nicely dressed as well as anyone, but it really isn't worth mending these old things. She picked up her book about the elegant girls who were disturbing her serenity and went over to the armchair with it. Well, Judy, you go and sew up these rents and put some buttons on your frock. Esther spoke with unusual determination. Judy's eyes snapped and sparkled. Is that a dagger that I see before me, the handle to my hand? Come, let me gasp it, grasp it, she said saucily snatching one of the pins from Esther's dress, fastening her own with it and dropping a curtsy. Esther reddened a little now. That's the general, Judy. He always pulls the buttons off my wrappers when I play with him, but I'm forgetting. Children, I have bad news for you. There was a breathless silence. Everyone crowded round her knees. Sentence has been proclaimed, said Judy dramatically. Let us shave our heads and don sackcloth. Your father says he cannot allow such conduct to go on unpunished, especially as you have all been unusually tiresome lately. Therefore, you are all to be taken away and hanged by the neck until we are dead. Be quiet, Judy. I have tried my best to beg you off, but it only makes him more vexed. Which is word number three, vexed. V-E-X-E-D. Hope you can read that okay. I just realized the orange pen's a bit like vexed. 
So you're actually going to hear that word, I think, either two or three more times in this chapter. So make sure you listen for it. It only makes him more vexed. He says, you are the untidiest, most unruly lot of children in Sydney, and he will punish you each time you do anything, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, shut up, Judy. Can't you let us hear? Pip, Pip put his hand over her mouth and held her by the hair while Esther told the news. None of you are to go to the pantomime. The seats were taken for Thursday night, and now, you very foolish children, you will all have to stay at home. Pantomime, in this case, is referring to something very much like a play or going to the theater. There was a perfect, perfect howl of dismay for a minute or two. They had all been looking forward to this treat for nearly a month, and the disappointment was really bitter, was really a bitter one to them all. Oh, I say, Esther, that's too bad, really. All the fellows at school have been. Pip's handsome face flushed angrily, and for such a little thing, too. Just because you had roast fowl for dinner, said Judy in a half-choked voice. Oh, Esther, why couldn't you have had cow or horse or hippopotamus? Anything but roast fowl. Couldn't you get around him, Esther? Meg looked anxiously at her. Dear Esther, do. Oh, you sweet, beautiful Essie, do try. They clung round her eagerly. Baby flung her arms around her neck and nearly choked her. Nell stroked her cheek. Pip patted her back and besought her to be a good fellow. Bunty buried his, hair, his nose in her hair and wept a silent tear. Meg clasped her hand in an access of unhappiness. The general gave a series of delighted squeals and Judy in her wretchedness smacked him for his pains. Okay, there was a word in there. Pip patted her back and besought her to be a good fellow. So that's besought, B-E-S-O-U-G-H-T, besought. Esther would do her best, beg as she had never done before, coax, beseech, wheedle, threaten, and they let her go at last with that assurance. Only I advise you all to be preternaturally good and quiet all day, she said, looking back from the doorway. That would have most effect with him and he is going to be at home all day. There was a very long word in there. Preternaturally. P-R-E-T-E-R-N-A-T-U-R a L L Y preternaturally. Gosh, that's a big one. Good. It was absolutely painful to witness the virtue of those children for the rest of the day. It was holiday time and Miss Marsh was away, but not once did the sound of quarreling or laughing or crying fly down to the lower regions. Citizens of Rome, the eyes of the world are upon you. Judy said solemnly, and all had promised so to conduct themselves that their father's heart could not fail to be melted. Pip put on his school jacket, brushed his hair, took a pile of school books and proceeded to the study where his father was writing letters and where he was allowed to do his home lessons. Well, what do you want? said the captain with a frown. No, it's no good coming to me about that pup, sir. I won't have you keep it. I came to study, sir, said Pitt mildly. I feel I'm a bit backward with my mathematics, so I won't waste all the holidays when I'm costing you so much and school fees. The captain gave a little gasp and looked hard at Pip, but the boy's face was so unsmiling and earnest that he was disarmed and actually congratulated himself that his eldest son was at last seeing the error of his ways. There are those set of problems in that drawer that I did when I was at school, he said graciously. If they are any of use to you, you can get them out. Thanks awfully. They will be a great help, said Pip gratefully. 
He examined them with admiration plainly, but to depi <laughs> plainly depicted upon his face. How very clearly and correctly you worked, father, he said with a sigh. I wonder if I'll ever get as good as this. How old were you, father, when you did them? About your age, said the captain, picking up the papers. He examined them with his head on one side. He was rather proud of them, seeing he had utterly forgotten now how to work decimal fractions and could not have done a quadratic equation to save his life. Still, I don't think you need to be quite discouraged, Pip. I was rather beyond the other boys in my class in these subjects, I remember. We can't all excel in the same thing, and I'm glad to see you are beginning to realize the importance of work. Yes, father. Meg had betaken herself to the drawing room and was sitting on the floor before the music canterbury with scissors, thimble, and a roll of narrow blue ribbon on her knee and all her father's songs that he so often complained were falling to pieces spread out before her. He saw her once as he passed the door and looked surprised and pleased. Thank you, Margaret. They wanted it badly. I'm glad you can make yourself useful after all, he said. Yes, father. Meg stitched on industriously. He went back to his study where Pip's head was at a studious, absorbed angle and pyramids of books and sheaves of paper were on the table. He wrote two more letters and there came a little knock at the door. Come in, he called, and there entered Nell. She was carrying very carefully a little tray covered with a snow white doily and on it were a glass of milk and a plate of mulberries. She placed it before him. I thought perhaps you would like a little lunch, father, she said gently, and Pip was seized with a sudden coughing fit. My dear child, he said. He looked at it very thoughtfully. The last glass of milk I had, Nellie, was when I was Pip's age and was Barlow's lad at rugby. It made me ill and I have never touched it since. But this won't hurt you. You will drink this? She gave him one of her most beautiful looks. I would soon as drink the water the maids wash up in my child. He took a mulberry, ate it, and made a wry face. They're not fit to eat. After you've eaten about six, you don't notice they're sour, she said eagerly, but he pushed them away. I'll take your word for it. Then he looked at her curiously. What made you think of bringing me anything, Nellie? I don't ever remember you doing so before. I thought you might be hungry riding here so long, she said gently, and Pip choked again badly, and she withdrew. Outside in the blazing sunshine, Judy was mowing the lawn. They only kept one man, and, as his time was so taken up with the horses and stable work generally, the garden was allowed to fall into neglect. More than once, the captain had spoken vexedly of the untidy lawns and said he was ashamed for visitors to come to the house. So Judy, brimming over with zeal, armed herself with an abnormally large scythe and set to work on the long, long grass. And that is word number six, scythe, S-C-Y-T-H-E. And that's what Judy is using to cut the grass, a scythe. Good heavens, Helen, you'll cut your legs off, called her father in an agitated tone. He had stopped out onto the front veranda for a mild cigar after the mulberry, just as she brought her scythe around with an admirable sweep and decapitated a whole array of yellow helmeted dandelions. She turned and gave him a beautiful smile. Oh no, father, why, I'm quite a dab at mowing. She gave it another alarming, but truly scientific sweep. See that, and that, and that. That carried off a fragment of her dress, and that switched off the, type, the top of a rose bush. But those are details to everything, of course. Accidents will happen even to the best regulated grass cutters, she said composedly, and raising the scythe for a fresh circle. 
Stop immediately, Helen. Why ever can't you go and play quietly with your doll and do not do things like this? Said her father irascibly. Irascibly, that's a fun word. And it's number seven. Irascibly, I-R-A-S-C-I-B-L-Y, irascibly. And where in the world am I? Oh. <laughs> and I was after doing it just to pleasure him, she said, apparently addressing the dandelions. Well, it won't pleasure him to have to provide you with cork, loo, cork legs and restock the garden, he said dryly. Put it down. Sure, and it's allegiance itself this side. You wouldn't be after leaving half undone like a man with only one cheek shaved. Judy affected an Irish brogue at intervals for some occult reason of her own. I don't know how to do an Irish brogue, so just bear with me. Imagine it near. <laughs> the captain hid a slight smile in his mustache. The little girl looked so comical standing there in her short old pink frock, a broken brimmed hat on her tangle of dark curls, her eyes sparkling, her face flushed, the great scythe in her hands and the saucy words on her lips. He came down and examined it. It was done excellently well like most of the things Miss Judy attempted. Mischief always included, and her little black stocking legs were still in a good state of preservation. Hmm, well, you can finish it then, as Pat's busy. How did you learn to mow, young lady of wonderful accomplishments? He looked at her questioningly. And what made you set yourself such a task? Judy gave her curls a quick push off her hot forehead. A, for it was inborn in me, she answered instantly. And B, sure, and don't I love you and delight to plays ya. He went in again slowly, thoughtfully. Judy always mystified him. He, under, he understood her the least of any of his children, and sometimes the thought of her worried him. At present, she was only a sharp, clever, and frequently impertinent child, but he felt she was utterly different from the other six, and it gave him an aggrieved kind of feeling when he thought about it, which was not very often. He remembered her own mother had often said she trembled for Judy's future. That restless fire of hers that shone out of her dancing eyes and glowed scarlet on her cheeks in excitement and lent amazing energy and activity to her young life body would either make a noble, daring, brilliant woman of her, or else she would be shipwrecked on rocks the others would never come to, and it would flame up higher and higher and consume her. Be careful of Judy had been almost the last words of the anxious mother, when in the light that comes and when the world is going out, she had seen with terrible clearness the stones and briars in the way of that particular pair of small, eager feet. And she had died, and Judy was stumbling right amongst them now, and her father could not be careful of her because he absolutely did not know how. As he went up to the veranda steps again and through the hall, he was wishing almost prayerfully she had not been cast in so different a mold from the others, wishing he could snap out that strange flame in her that made him so uneasy at times. He gave a great puff at his cigar and sighed profoundly. Then he turned on his heel and went off toward the stables to forget it all. The man was away, exercising one of the horses in the long paddock, but there was something stirring in the harness room, so he went in. There was a little dripping wet figure standing over a great bucket and dipping something in and out with charming vigor. At the sound of his footsteps, Baby turned around and lifted a perspiring little face to his. I's washing the kitsies for you and flibberty gibbet, she said beamingly. There were two favorite kittens of his, shivering, miserable, up to their necks in a lather of soapy, wa soapy water and flibberty gibbet, the beautiful little fox terrier he had just bought for his wife, chained to a post, also wet, 
miserable, and woebegone, also undergoing the cleaning process and being scrubbed and swilled till his very reason was tottering. And I missed number eight somewhere. Somebody was aggrieved somewhere. <laughs> A-G-G-R-I-E-V-E-D, aggrieved. Someone was aggrieved, probably the captain. Sorry, I forgot that one, but I can't forget my favorite Wobegon, W-O-E-B-E-G-O-N-E, Wobegon. That is a fun one. <laughs> and that's what Flibberty Gibbet, also a great word, the little fox terrier dog was feeling. Okay. <laughs> They're so clean and nicey. No horrid old fleas in them now. Aren't you glad? You can let Flipperty go in your bed now and Kitty Black's eye is... Poor baby never finished her speech. She had a confused of idea of hearing a little swear word from her father, of being sh shaken in a most ungentle fashion and put outside the stable, while the unfortunate animals were dried and treated with great consideration. But the worst was yet to come, and the results were so exceedingly bad that the young Wolcotts determined never again to assume virtues that they had not. Bunty, of course, desired to help the cause as strongly as the others, and to that end, his first action was to go into his bedroom and perform starting, startling ablutions with his face, neck, and hands. I had a hard time even saying that one. Ablutions. A B L U T I O N S. Ablutions. And he did that to his face and neck and hands. And I don't know if you remember, but talked about Bunty in one of the previous chapters always being dirty, except for church, where the front part was clean. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you the answer to this one. Ablutions means to scrub or clean vigorously. So he was really cleaning himself up. Then he took his soapy, shiny countenance and red, much bescrubbed hands downstairs and sunned himself under his father's very nose, hoping to attract favorable comment. But he was bidden irritably, go and play, and saw he would have to find fresh means of appeasement. He wandered into the study with vague thoughts of tidying the tidy bookshelves, <laughs> of tidying the tidy bookshelves, but Dick was there surrounded with books and whittling a stick for a catapult, so he went out again. Then he climbed the stairs and explored his father's bedroom and dressing room. In the latter, there was a wide field for his operations. A full dress uniform was lying across a chair and it struck Bunty the gold buttons were looking less bright than they should. So he spent a harmless quarter of an hour and polishing them up. Next, he burnished some spurs, which was also harmless. Then he cast about for fresh employment. There was quite a colony of dusty boots in one corner of the room, and there was a great bottle of black, treacly looking varnish on the mantelpiece. Bunty conceived the brilliant idea of cleaning the whole lot and standing them in a neat row to meet his father's delighted eyes. He found a handkerchief on the floor of super fine cambric, though dirty, poured upon it a liberal allowance of varnish and attacked the first pair. A bright polish rewarded him for they were patent leather ones, but the next and the next and the next would not shine however hard he rubbed. There was a step on the stair, the firm, well-known step of his father, and he paused a moment with a look of conscious virtue on his small, shiny face. But it fled all at once, and a look of horror replaced it. He had stuck the bottle on a great armchair for convenience as he was sitting on the floor, and now he noticed it had fallen on its side, and a black, horrid stream was issuing from its neck. And it was the chair with the uniform on and one of the sleeves was soaked with the stuff and the beautiful white shirt that lay there too, waiting for a button was sticky, horrible. 
Bunty gave a wild, terrified look around the room for some place to efface himself, but there was no sheltering corners or curtains, and there was not time to get into the bedroom and under the bed. And that is number 11, efface, E-F-F-A-C-E, efface. I bet you can figure that one out before you look it up. He was looking for somewhere to efface himself but there were no sheltering corners or curtains. He knew he was probably about to get in trouble, so what do you think he was doing? So put down what you think it might be and then look it up and see if you're right. Near the window was a large size medicine chest and in despair, Bunty crushed himself into it. His legs huddled up his head between his knees and an ominous rattle of displaced bottles in his ears. The next minute, his father was in the room. Great heavens, God bless my soul, he said, and Bunty shivered from head to foot. Then he said a lot of things very quickly. Foreign language, as Judy called it, kicked something over and shouted, Esther, in a terrifying tone. But Esther was down in one of the paddocks with the general, so there was no reply. More foreign language, more stamping about. Bunty's teeth chattered noisily. He put up his hand to hold his mouth together, and the cupboard, overbalanced, fell right over, precipitating its occupant right at his father's feet and the bottles everywhere. I'm actually going to skip the next couple of chapters not chapters, the next couple of paragraphs, because uh, back in this time period, it was okay, considered okay to physically punish your children. And it goes into detail about that. We now know that's not a good thing. And I don't really want to read that. So I'm gonna just gloss over those. But um, just know that's what happened there. So Bunty wriggled himself free. It wasn't me. I never, true faith, it wasn't my fault. It's all the others. He then fled howling and yelling to the nursery where he fell on the floor and kicked and rolled about as if half killed. You snakes, he sobbed, addressing the others who had flown from all parts at this noisy outcry. You me pigs i hadn't been i hadn't no foul and i've had all the beating you sneaks oh you bleeding all over they couldn't help laughing a bit bunty always was so irresistibly comic when he was hurt ever so little but still they comforted him as well as they could and tried to find out what had happened esther came in presently looking very worried well, they said in a breath, you really are the most exasperating children, she said vexedly. There's that word vexedly again. But the pantomime, quick, Esther, have you asked him? They cried impatiently. The pantomime, he says he would rather make it worth Mr. Reginald's while to take it off the boards than that one of you should catch a glimpse of it. And it serves you very well right. Meg, for goodness sake, give Bunty some dry clothes. Just look at her. And Judy, if you have any feeling for me, take off that frock. Bunty, you wicked boy, I'll call your father if you don't stop that noise. Nell, take the scissors from the general. He'll poke his eyes out, bless him. The young stepmother leaned back in her chair and looked round her tragically. She had never seen her husband so thoroughly angered and her beautiful lips quivered when she remembered how he had seemed to blame her for it all. Meg hadn't moved, the water was trickling, Meg hadn't moved, the water was trickling slowly down off baby's clothes and making a pool on the floor. Bunty was still giving vent to spasmodic boos and hoos. Judy was whistling stormily, and the general, molted of the scissors, was licking his own muddy shoe all over with his dear little red tongue. And that's your final word for tonight. Number 12, molted, M-U-L-C-T-E-D, molted. 
A sob rose in her throat, two tears welled up in her eyes and fell down her smooth, lovely cheeks. Seven of you, and I'm only 20, she said pitifully. Oh, it's too bad. Oh dear, it is too bad. And that is the end of chapter three. Next time we'll read chapter four, The General Sees Active Service. Wonder what that's about. Thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.